This second, into tiny pieces. Ayaz had had a dream about this, and he hid in two stones in his sleeve. He crushed the pearl to powder between them. As Joseph at the bottom of the well listened to the end of his story, so such listeners understand success and unsuccess is one thing. Don't worry about forms. If someone wants your horse, let him have it. Horses are for hurrying ahead of the others. The court assembly screamed at the recklessness of Ayas, how can you do that? What the king says is worth more than any pearl. I honor the king, not some colored stone. The princes immediately fell on their knees and put their foreheads on the ground. Their sighs went up like a smoke cloud asking forgiveness. The king gestured to his executioner as though to say, take out this trash. Aya sprang forward, your mercy makes them bow like this. Give them their lives, let them keep hoping for union with you. They see their forgetfulness now, as the drunken man did when he said, I didn't know what I was doing, and then someone pointed out, but you invited that forgetfulness into you. You drank it. There was a choice. They know deeply now how imitation lulled them to sleep. Don't separate yourself from them. Look at all their heads against the floor. Raise their faces into yours. Let them wash in your cool washing place. Z27 I is in his speech always get to this point and then the pen breaks. How can a saucer contain the ocean? The drunks break their cups, but you poured that wine. Aya said, you picked me to crush the pearl. Don't punish the others for my drunken obedience. Punish them when I'm sober, because I'll never be sober again. Whoever bows down like they are bowing down will not rise up in his old self again. Like a gnat in your buttermilk, they've become your buttermilk. The mountains are trembling, their map and compass are the lines in your palm. Usum, I need a hundred mouths to say this, but I only have this one. A hundred thousand impressions from the spirit are wanting to come through here. I feel stunned in this abundance, crushed and dead. Put this design in your carpet. Spiritual experience is a modest woman who looks lovingly at only one man. It's a great river where ducks live happily, and crows drower. The visible bowl of form contains food that is both nourishing and a source of heartburn. There is an unseen presence we honor that gives the gifts. 128. Pure water, near the millstone, pure wind, where dust blown up into shapes. Your spirit, near the opening and closing of our hands. Near the clarity, where this language that tries to say it. Your joy, where all the different kinds of laughing. Any movement or sound is a profession of faith, as the millstone grinding is explaining how it believes in the river. No metaphor can say this, but I can't stop pointing to the beauty. Every moment and place says, put this design in your carpet. Like the shepherd in book 2, who wanted to pick the lice off God's robe, and stitch up God's shoes, I want to be in such a passionate adoration that my tent gets pitched against the sky. Let the beloved come and sit like a guard dog in front of the tent. When the ocean surges, don't let me just hear it. Let it splash inside my chest. H-A-L-L-A-J Halage said what he said and went to the origin through the hole in the scaffold. I cut a cap's worth of cloth from his robe, and it swamped over me from head to foot. Years ago, I broke a bunch of roses from the top of his wall. 
A thorn from that is still in my palm, working beaver. Z29. From Halage, I learned to hunt lions, but I became something hungrier than a lion. I was a frisky colt. He broke me with a quiet hand on the side of my head. A person comes to him naked. It's cold. There's a fur coat floating in the river. Jump in and get it, he says. You dive in. You reach for the coat. It reaches for you. It's a live bear that has fallen in upstream, drifting with the current. How long does it take? Halage yells from the bank. Don't wait. You answer. This coat has decided to wear me home. A little part of a story, a hint. Do you need long sermons on Halage? We free. My love wanders the rooms, melodious, flute notes, plucked wires, full of the wine the Magi drank on the way to Bethlehem. We are free. The moon comes from its quiet corner, puts a pitcher of water down in the center. The circle of surface flames. One of us kneels to kiss the threshold. One drinks, with wine flames playing over his face. One watches the gathering, and says to any cold onlookers, This dance is the joy of existence. 130. I am filled with you. Skin, blood, bone, brain, and soul. There's no room for lack of trust, or trust. Nothing in this existence but that existence. 131. 12 Kai the Shake. I have such a teacher. On the Shake. The existence of the beloved is not provable, nor is it fantasy. The friend, as Rumi usually calls this presence within and infinitely beyond the senses, is elusive and nearer than the big vein on your neck, you need a mirror to see it. The shake is a mirror, a reminder of that presence, and a cook. The understanding that comes through a shake gives nourishment and transforming energy to many. Rumi's image of a disciple is a chickie that sprouts and enjoys the rainy garden of sexual pleasure. It matures to its hardened form, then gets picked and thrown in the cooking pot. The cook's tending is careful and constant. And, in Rumi's case, careless. Gradually the disciple softens and takes on flavors the cook adds. Eventually he or she becomes tasty enough to be appealing to those who in the Sufi tradition are called the true human beings. So the chicken moves from garden to cooking pot to a taste for the cook, finally to become sustenance for a mysterious community. Chicky to cook. A chicky leaps almost over the rim of the pot where it's being boiled. Why are you doing this to me? The cook knocks him down with the ladle. Don't you try to jump out. You think I'm torturing you. I'm giving you flavor. 232. So you can mix with spices and rice and be the lovely vitality of a human being. Remember when you drank rain in the garden. That was for this. Grace first. Sexual pleasure, then a boiling new life begins, and the friend has something good to eat. Eventually the chickpea will say to the cook, boil me some more. Hit me with the skimming spoon. I can't do this by myself. I'm like an elephant that dreams of gardens back in Hindustan and doesn't pay attention to his driver. You're my cook, my driver, my way into existence. I love your cooking. The cook says, I was once like you, fresh from the ground. Then I boiled in time, and boiled in the body, two fierce boilings. My animal soul grew powerful. 
I controlled it with practices, and boiled some more, and boiled once beyond that, and became your teacher. I have such a teacher. Last night my teacher taught me the lesson of poverty, having nothing and wanting nothing. I am a naked man standing inside a mine of rubies, clothed in red silk. I absorb the shining and now I see the ocean, billions of simultaneous motions. Z33. Moving in me, a circle of lovely, quiet people becomes the ring on my finger. Then the wind and thunder of rain on the way. I have such a teacher. Sublime generosity. I was dead, then alive. Weeping, then laughing. The power of love came into me, and I became fierce like a lion, then tender like the evening star. He said, you're not mad enough. You don't belong in this house. I went wild and had to be tied up. He said, still not wild enough to stay with us. I broke through another layer into joyfulness. He said, it's not enough. I died. He said, you're a clever little man, full of fantasy and doubting. I plucked out my feathers and became a fool. He said, now you're the candle for this assembly. But I'm no candle. Look, I'm scattered smoke. He said, you are the shape, the guide. But I'm not a teacher. I have no power. He said, you already have wings. I cannot give you wings. Point three four. But I wanted his wings. I felt like some flightless chicken. Then new events said to me, don't move. A sublime generosity is coming toward you. And old love said, stay with me. I said, I will. You are the fountain of the sun's light. I am a willow shadow on the ground. You make my raggedness silky. The soul of dawn is like darkened water that slowly begins to say thank you, thank you. Then at sunset, again, Venus gradually changes into the moon and then the whole night ski. This comes of smiling back at your smile. The chess master says nothing, other than moving the silent chess piece. That I am part of the ploys of this game makes me amazingly happy. Like this. If anyone asks you how the perfect satisfaction of all our sexual wanting will look, lift your face and say. Like this. When someone mentions the gracefulness of the night ski, climb up on the roof and dance and say. Like this. Z35. If anyone wants to know what spirit is or what God's fragrance means, lean your head toward him or her. Keep your face there close. Like this. When someone quotes the old poetic image about clouds gradually uncovering the moon, slowly loosen not by not the strings of your robe. Like this. If anyone wonders how Jesus raised the dead, don't try to explain the miracle. Kiss me on the lips. Like this. Like this. When someone asks what it means to die for love, point here. If someone asks how tall I am, frown and measure with your fingers the space between the creases on your forehead. This tall. The soul sometimes leaves the body, then returns. When someone doesn't believe that, walk back into my house. Like this. When lovers moan, they're telling our story. Like this. I am a sky where spirits live. Stare into this deepening blue, while the breeze says a secret. Like this. When someone asks what there is to do, light a candle in his hand. Like this. 136. 
How did Joseph Sent come to Jacob? How did Jacob's sight return? A little wind cleans the eyes. Cool. Like this. When Shams comes back from Tabriz, he'll put just his head around the edge of the door to surprise us. Like this. A bowl. Imagine the time the particle you were returned where it came from. The family darling comes home. Wine, without being contained in cups, is handed around. Cool. A red glint appears in a granite outcrop, and suddenly the whole cliff turns to ruby. At dawn I walk along with a monk on his way to the monastery. We do the same work, I told him. We suffer the same. He gave me a bowl. And I saw, the soul has this shape. Shams, you the teach is an actual sunlight. Help me now. Being in the middle of being hardly in myself, and hardly outside. 37. Wax. When I see you and how you are, I close my eyes to the other. For your Solomon seal I become wax throughout my body. I wait to be light. I give up opinions on all matters. I become the reed flute for your breath. You were inside my hand. I kept reaching around for something. I was inside your hand, but I kept asking questions of those who know very little. I must have been incredibly simple or drunk or insane to sneak into my own house and steal money, to climb over the fence and take my own vegetables. But no more. I've gotten free of that ignorant fist that was pinching and twisting my secret self. The universe and the light of the stars come through me. I am the crescent moon put up over the gate to the festival. No room for form. On the night when you cross the street from your shop in your house to the cemetery, you'll hear me hailing you from inside the open grave, and you'll realize how we've always been together. I am the clear consciousness core of your being, the same in ecstasy as in self-hating fatigue. That night, when you escape the fear of snakebite and all irritation with the ants, you'll hear my familiar voice, see the candle being lit. 38. Smell the incense, the surprise meal fixed by the lover inside all your other lovers. This heart tumult is my signal to you igniting in the tomb. So don't fuss with the shroud and the graveyard road dust. Those get ripped open and washed away in the music of our finally meeting. And don't look for me in a human shape. I am inside here looking. No room for form with love this strong. Beat the drum and let the poet speak. This is a day of purification for those who are already mature and initiated into what love is. No need to wait until we die. There's more to want here than money and being famous and bites of roasted meat. Now, what shall we call this new sort of gazing house that has opened in our town where people sit quietly and pour out their glancing like light, like answering? Childhood friends. You may have heard, it's the custom for kings to let warriors stand on the left, the side of the heart, and courage. On the right they put the chancellor, and various secretaries, because the practice of bookkeeping and writing usually belongs to the right hand. In the center, the suffice, because in meditation they become mirrors. The king can look at their faces and see his original state. 39. Give the beautiful ones mirrors, and let them fall in love with themselves. That way they polish their souls and kindle remembering in others. 
A close childhood friend once came to visit Joseph. They had shared the secrets that children tell each other when they're lying on their pillows at night before they go to sleep. These two are completely truthful with each other. The friend asked, what was it like when you realized your brothers were jealous and what they planned to do? I felt like a lion with a chain around its neck. Not degraded by the chain, and not complaining, but just waiting for my power to be recognized. How about down in the well, and in prison? How was it then, like the moon when it's getting smaller, yet knowing the fullness to come? Like a seed pearl ground in the mortar for medicine, that knows it will now be the light in a human eye. Like a wheat grain that breaks open in the ground, then grows, then gets harvested, then crushed in the mill for flour, then baked, then crushed again between teeth to become a person's deepest understanding. Lost in love, like the songs the planters sing the night after they sow the seed. There is no end to any of this. Back to something else the good man and Joseph talked about. Ah my friend, what have you brought me? You know a traveler should not arrive empty-handed at the door of a friend like me. That's going to the grinding stone without your wheat. 140. God will ask at the resurrection, did you bring me a present? Did you forget? Did you think you wouldn't see me? Joseph kept teasing, let's have it. I want my gift. The guest began, you can't imagine how I look for something for you. Nothing seemed appropriate. You don't take gold down into a gold mine, or a drop of water to the Sea of Oman. Everything I thought of was like bringing human seed to Kermanshah where human comes from. You have all seeds in your barn. You even have my love and my soul, so I can't even bring those. I've brought you a mirror. Look at yourself, and remember me. He took the mirror out from his world where he was hiding it. What is the mirror of being? Non-being. Always bring a mirror of non-existence as a gift. Any other present is foolish. Let the poor man look deep into generosity. Let bread see a hungry man. Let kindling behold a spark from the flint. An empty mirror and your worst destructive habits, when they are held up to each other, that's when the real making begins. That's what art and crafting are. A tailor needs a torn garment to practice his expertise. The trunks of trees must be cut and cut again so they can be used for fine carpentry. Your doctor must have a broken leg to doctor. Your defects are the ways that glory gets manifested. Whoever sees clearly what's diseased in himself begins to gallop on the way. 4 feet. There is nothing worse than thinking you are well enough. More than anything, self-corplacency blocks the workmanship. Put your vileness up to a mirror and weep. Get that self-satisfaction flowing out of you. Satan thought, I am better than Adam, and that better than is still strongly in us. Your stream water may look clean, but there's unstirred matter on the bottom. Your shake can dig a side channel that will drain that waste off. Trust your wound to a teacher's surgery. Flies collect on a wound. They cover it. Those flies of your self-protecting feelings, your love for what you think is yours. Let a teacher wave away the flies and put a plaster on the wound. Don't turn your head. Keep looking at the bandaged place. That's where the light enters you. And don't believe for a moment that you're healing yourself. The mouse and the camel. A mouse caught hold of a camel's lead rope in his two forelegs and walked off with it, imitating the camel drivers. 
the camel went along, letting the mouse feel heroic. Enjoy yourself, he thought. I have something to teach you, presently. They came to the edge of a great river. The mouse was dumbfounded. 42. What are you waiting for? Step forward into the river. You are my leader. Don't stop here. I'm afraid of being drowned. The camel walked into the water. It's only just above the knee. Your knee. Your knee is a hundred times over my head. Well, maybe you shouldn't be leading a camel. Stay with those like yourself. A mouse has nothing really to say to a camel. Would you help me get across? Get up on my hump. I am made to take hundreds like you across. You are not a prophet, but go humbly on the way of the prophets, and you can arrive where they are. Don't try to steer the boat. Don't open a shop by yourself. Listen. Keep silent. You are not God's mouthpiece. Try to be an ear, and if you do speak, ask for explanations. The source of your arrogance and anger is your lust and the rootedness of that is in your habits. Someone who makes a habit of eating clay gets mad when you try to keep him from it. Being a leader can also be a poisonous habit, so that when someone questions your authority, you think, he's trying to take over. You may respond courteously, but inside you rage. Always check your inner state with the Lord of your heart. Copper doesn't know it's copper, until it's changed to gold. Your loving doesn't know its majesty, until it knows its helplessness. 143. These kids from the friend, a robe of skin and veins, a teacher within, wear them and become a school, with a greater shape nearby. The lame goat. You've seen a herd of goats going down to the water. The lame and dreamy goat brings up the rear. There are worried faces about that one, but now they're laughing, because look, as they return, that goat is leading. There are many different kinds of knowing. The lame goat's kind is a branch that traces back to the roots of presence. Learn from the lame goat, and leave the herd home. 144. 13. X Recognizing Elegance. Your reasonable father. On elegance. The sudden opening of one's eyes to the elaborate, extravagant beauty around us. Watching Madagascan meerkats on the Discovery Channel. The gorgeous dirt road down to the river. 300 million galaxies. The gold around a frog's eye. The intricacy of the present moment. All the wealth we need. Rumi feels this abundance, and his gratitude for it pours out the waterfall of his work. It may be that the clarity Rumi calls, reason, is a brilliant lawfulness that ecologists and astronomers examine as the coherence in any system, and that the mystic and the scientist both attend the same layered intelligence, the grand and precise artistry of existence. Father Reason The universe is a form of divine law, your reasonable father. When you feel ungrateful to him, the shapes of the world seem mean and ugly. Make peace with that father, the elegant patterning, and every experience will fill with immediacy. Because I love this, I am never bored. Beauty constantly wells up, a noise of spring water in my ear and in my inner being. Tree limbs rise and fall like the ecstatic arms of those who have submitted to the mystical life. 145. Leaf sounds talk together like poets making fresh metaphors. The green felt cover slips, and we get a flash of the mirror underneath. Think how it will be when the whole thing is pulled away. 
I tell only one one thousandth of what I see, because there's so much doubt everywhere. The conventional opinion of this poetry is, it shows great optimism for the future. But Father Reason says, no need to announce the future. This now is it, this. Your deepest need and desire is satisfied by the moment's energy here in your hand. A craftsman pulled a reed from the reed bed, cut holes in it, and called it a human being. Since then, it's been wailing a tender agony of parting, never mentioning the skill that gave it life as a food. R underscore underscore. Humble living does not diminish. It fills. Going back to a simpler self gives wisdom. When a man makes up a story for his child, he becomes a father and a child together, listening. 146. New Moon, Halal. You heard about the qualities of Halal. Now hear about the thinness of Halal, which is more advanced than Halal. He denied his knocks more than some of you who move backward, from being an illumined globe toward becoming again an opaque stone. Remember the story of the young guest who came before a certain king. And how old are you, my lad? Tell the truth now. Say it out. 18, well 17. Actually, ah, uh, 15. Keep going, you'll end up in your mother's womb. 16. For the man who went to borrow a horse. Take the gray. No, not that one. Why? It goes in reverse. It backs up. Then turn its tail toward your home. The beast you ride is your various appetites. Change your wanting. When you prune weak branches, the remaining fruit get tastier. Lust can be redirected, so that even when it takes you backward, it goes toward shelter. A strong intention can make two oceans wide, be the size of a blanket, or 700 years, the time it takes to walk to someone you love. True seekers keep riding straight through, whereas big, lazy, Self-worshipping beasts unload their pack animals in a farmyard and say, this is far enough. 14.7 Do you know the story of the travelers who came to a village in early spring? There's an abandoned house with an open door. Why don't we wait for this cold spell to pass? This old woman's chill, they call it. Let's put our baggage in here and rest. A deep voice from inside, no, unload outside, then enter. This is a meeting hall of great dignity. Where are such secret sanctuaries? Although he worked in a stable as a groom, Halal was an enlightened master. His employer did not understand Halal's state. He knew up and down and north, south, east, west, the evidence of the senses, but nothing else. The color of the ground is in front of us, but prophetic light is hidden. One person sees a minaret, but not the bird perched there. A second person sees the bird, but not the hare it carries. A third sees minaret, bird, and hare. Until you can see the thread of the hair, the knot of awareness will not be loosened. The body is the minaret. Obedience, the bird, or 300 birds, or two, however you want it. The second person sees the bird, and only the bird. The hair is the secret that belongs to the bird. No nest built with such material will go unused. A song thread flows continuously out of the bird. 248 Try to see this bird on its clay tower, and also the hair floating in its beak. A 
Jalal bin Amzil. Nine days he lies sick in the stable. No one notices, except the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. He comes to visit. Halal's employer is ecstatic. With elaborate ceremony he emerges from his upstairs room and kisses the ground in front of the Prophet. In God's name, please honor this house. I'm not here to visit you. Who then? There is a new moon new man planted near here, spending the lightness of his humility like blossoms on the ground. Where is Halal? I haven't seen him for days. He must be out with the mules and the horses. Muhammad runs to the stable. It's dark, and the stench of manure is strong, but all that vanishes when friendship enters. Miracles don't cause faith, but rather the scent of kindredness that unites people. Miracles overwhelm unbelief. Faith grows from friendship. With the familiar fragrance, Halal wakes up. How could such a thing be in a stable? Through the legs of the horses he sees the robes of Muhammad. He comes crawling out from the dark corner and lays his cheek. 149. On Muhammad's feet, Muhammad puts his cheek on Halal's and kisses his head and face. How hidden can one be? Are you better? How are you? How? A man sits and eats damp clay for moisture. How is it with him when a flood of fresh prophetic rainwater suddenly rides him along? How is it when a blind, filthy dog wakes up, and finds that he's a lion, and not a lion such as could be killed, but a spirit lion who shatters sword and javelin with just his presence? How would that feel? A man crawls for years on his stomach with his eyes closed. Then one moment he opens his eyes, and he's in a garden. It's spring. How is it to be free of how, loose and howless nests? Howlers sit waiting around your table. Throw them a bone. This suggestion. Wash before going to the water tank. The waters there have grace enough to clean and give you peace, but wash yourself of both before you go. Wash off all wonderings why and workings out however. Don't take those with you to the big water tank. Usum. Bats don't bother Usumunan. He's an expert on sunlight. He's written about the new moon, Halal. Now he'll write about the full moon, the shape. New moon and full moon are the same. I so. A new moon teaches gradualness and deliberation and how one gives birth to oneself slowly. Patience with small details makes perfect a large work, like the universe. What nine months of attention does for an embryo 40 early mornings will do for your gradually growing wholeness? Body Intelligence Your intelligence is always with you, overseeing your body, even though you may not be aware of its work. If you start doing something against your health, your intelligence will eventually scold you. If it hadn't been so lovingly close by, and so constantly monitoring, how could it hurt you? You and your intelligence are like the beauty and the precision of an astrolabe. Together, you calculate how near existence is to the sun. Your intelligence is marvelously intimate. It's not in front of you or behind, or to the left or the right. Now try, my friend, to describe how near is the creator of your intellect. Intellectual searching will not find the way to that king. The movement of your finger is not separate from your finger. 5 feet. You go to sleep, or you die, and there's no intelligent motion. Then you wake, and your fingers fill with meanings. Now consider the jewel lights in your eyes. 
How do they work? This visible universe has many weathers and variations. But uncle, uncle, the universe of the creation word, the divine command to be, that universe of qualities is beyond any pointing to. More intelligent than intellect, and more spiritual than spirit. No being is unconnected to that reality, and that connection cannot be said. There, there's no separation and no return. There are guides who can show you the way. Use them, but they will not satisfy your longing. Keep wanting that connection with all your pulsing energy. The throbbing vein will take you further than any thinking. Muhammad said, don't theorize about essence. All speculations are just more layers of covering. Human beings love coverings. They think the designs on the curtains are what's being concealed. 152. Observe the wonders as they occur around you. Don't claim them. Feel the artistry moving through, and be silent. Or say, I cannot praise you as you should be praised. Such words are infinitely beyond my understanding. The seed market. Can you find another market like this? Where, with your one lose you can buy hundreds of rose gardens? Where, for one seed you get a whole wilderness? For one weak breath, the divine wind. You've been fearful of being absorbed in the ground, or drawn up by the air. Now, your waterbed lets go and drops into the ocean, where it came from. It no longer has the form it had, but it's still water. The essence is the same. This giving up is not a repenting. It's a deep honoring of yourself. 153. When the ocean comes to you as a lover, marry, at once, quickly, for God's sake. Don't postpone it. Existence has no better gift. No amount of searching will find this. A perfect falcon, for no reason, has landed on your shoulder, and become yours. 154. Z4. JLT the howling necessity. Cry out in your weakness. On howling. My Sufi teacher, Bawa Mahayadeen, when he saw me, and knowing my name was Barks, would go into a wolf howl for a joke and a teaching. He mirrored some need to howl that he saw there walking in. He himself would often break into spontaneous praise songs while sitting on his bed. Crying out loud for help is Rumi's point. With that vulnerable breaking open in the psyche, the milk of grace starts to flow. Love dogs. One night a man was crying. Allah, Allah. His lips grew sweet with the praising, until a cynic said, So, I have heard you calling out, but have you ever gotten any response? The man had no answer to that. He quit praying and fell into a confused sleep. He dreamed he saw Peter, the guide of souls, in a thick, green foliage. Why did you stop praising? Because I've never heard anything back. This longing you express is the return message. The grief you cry out from draws you toward union. Is. Your pure sadness that wants help is the secret cup. Listen to the moan of a dog for its master. That whining is the connection. There are love dogs no one knows the names of. Give your life to be one of them. Cry out in your weakness. A dragon was pulling a bear into its terrible mouth. A courageous man went and rescued the bear. There are such helpers in the world, who rush to save anyone who cries out. Like mercy itself, they run toward the screaming. 
and they can't be bought off. If you were to ask one of those, why did you come so quickly? He or she would say, because I heard your helplessness. Where lowland is, that's where water goes. All medicine wants is pain to cure. And don't just ask for one mercy. Let them flood in. Let the sky open under your feet. Take the cotton out of your ears, the cotton of consolations, so you can hear the sphere music. Push the hair out of your eyes. Blow the phlegm from your nose, and from your brain. Let the wind breeze through. Leave no residue in yourself from that bilious fever. Take the cure for impotence. Z56 feet. That your manhood may shoot forth, and a hundred new beings come of your coming. Tear the binding from around the foot of your soul, and let it race around the track in front of the crowd. Loosen the knot of greed so tight on your neck. Accept your new good luck. Give your weakness to one who helps. Crying out loud and weeping are great resources. A nursing mother, all she does is wait to hear her child. Just a little beginning whimper, and she's there. God created the child, that is, your wanting, so that it might cry out, so that milk might come. Cry out, don't be stolid and silent with your pain. Lament, and let the milk of loving flow into you. The hard rain and wind are ways the cloud has to take care of us. Be patient, respond to every call that excites your spirit. Ignore those that make you fearful and sad, that degrade you back toward disease and death. The debtor shake. Sheikh Ahmad was continually in debt. He borrowed great sums from the wealthy and gave it out to the poor dervishes of the world. He built a Sufi monastery by borrowing. ZS5 And God was always paying his debts, turning sand into flour for this generous friend. The Prophet said that there were always two angels praying in the market. One said, Lord, give the poor wanderer help. The other, Lord, give the miser a poison. Especially loud is the former prayer when the wanderer is a prodigal like Sheikh Ahmad, the debtor Sheikh. For years, until his death, he scattered seed profusely. Even very near his death, with the signs of death clear, he sat surrounded by creditors. The creditors in a circle, and the great shake in the center gently melting into himself like a candle. The creditors were so sour-faced with worry that they could hardly breathe. Look at these despairing men, thought the shake. Do they think God does not have 400 gold dinars? Just at that moment a boy outside called, Halva, a sixth of a dirham for a piece. Fresh Halva, Sheikh Ahmad, with a nod of his head, directed the famulus to go and buy the whole tray of Halva. Maybe if these creditors eat a little sweetness, they won't look so bitterly on me. The servant went to the boy, how much for the whole lump of halva? Half a dinar, and some change. Don't ask too much from Suffice, my son. Half a dinar is enough. The boy handed over the tray, and the servant brought it to the sheikh, who passed it among his creditor guests. Please, eat, and be happy. The tray was quickly empty, and the boy asked the sheikh for his half a gold dinar. I-58. Where would I find such money? These men can tell you how in debt I am, and besides, I am fast on my way into non-existence. The boy threw the tray on the floor and started weeping loud and yelling, I wish I had broken my legs before I came in here. 
I wish I'd stayed in the bathhouse today. You gluttonous, plate looking suffice, washing your faces like cats. A crowd gathered. The boy continued, Oh Sheikh, my master will beat me if I come back without anything. The creditors joined in, How can you do this? You've devoured our properties, and now you add this one last debt before you die. Why? The Sheikh closes his eyes and does not answer. The boy weeps until afternoon prayers. The Sheikh withdraws underneath his coverlet, pleased with everything, pleased with eternity, pleased with death, and totally unconcerned with all the reviling talk around him. On a bright moon night, can you think the moon, cruising through the tenth house, can hear the dogs barking down here? But the dogs are doing what they're supposed to do. Water does not lose its purity because of a bit of weed floating in it. That king drinks wine on the riverbank until dawn, listening to the water music, not hearing the frog talk. The money knew the boy would have been just a few pennies from each of his creditors, but the sheikh's spiritual power prevents that from happening. No one gives the boy anything. 59. At afternoon prayers a servant comes with a tray from Adam, a friend of Ahmad's, and a man of great property. A covered tray. The sheikh uncovers the face of the tray, and on it there are 400 gold DMNARS, and in one corner, another half a dinar wrapped in a piece of paper. Immediately the cries of abasement, O king of sheikhs, lord of the lords of mystery. Forgive us. We were bumbling and crazed. We were knocking lamps over. We were, it's all right, you will not be held responsible for what you've said or done. The secret here is that I asked God and the way was shown that until the boy is weeping, God's merciful generosity was not loosened. Let the boy be like the pupil of your eye. If you want to wear a robe of spiritual sovereignty, let your eyes weep with the wanting. You did come to birth and bring the mysteries, your voice thunder makes us very happy. Roar, lion of the heart, and tear me open. I, O, Z5 P teaching stories, how the unseen world works. On the unseen, Ibn Khafif Shirazi tells this story. I heard that there were two great masters in Egypt, so I hurried to reach their presence. When I arrived, I saw two magnificent teachers meditating. I greeted them three times, but they did not answer. I meditated with them for four days. Each day I begged them to talk with me, since I had come such a long way. Finally the younger one opened his eyes. Ibn Kafi, life is short. Use the portion that's left to deepen yourself. Don't waste time greeting people. I asked him to give me some advice. Stay in the presence of those who remind you of your Lord, who not only speak wisdom, but are that. Then he went back into meditation. Ibn Khafif was being taught the importance of having his own experience of the unseen, and not to fret so much about the forms of greeting people, hearing wisdom, and about what we should be doing. There is a South Indian story about soap. Soap is the dirt we buy. We introduce it to the dirt we have, and the two dirts are so glad to see each other they come out and mix. They swim together in the warm pleasurable water and, at just the right moment, the washer licks the cloth of our true being free of both soap and dirt. Mystical poetry and other practices may function this way, as soap that dances with what disturbs our clarity. 
then at some moment they drop away and leave is clean, ready to be worn again. N-A-S-U-H Some time ago there was a man named NASA. He made his living shampooing women in a bathhouse. He had a face like a woman, but he was not a feminine, though he disguised his virility, so as to keep his job. Z6i He loved touching the wonder as he washed their hair. He stayed sexually alert, at full strength, all the time, massaging the beautiful women, especially the princess and her ladies-in-waiting. Sometimes he thought of changing jobs, of doing something where he wouldn't be so constantly lustful, but he couldn't quit. He went to a mystic saint and said, please remember me in a prayer. That holy man was spiritually free, and totally open to God. He knew Nasu's secret, but with God's gentleness he didn't speak it. A Gnostic says little, but inside he is full of mysteries, and crowded with voices. Whoever is served that cup keeps quiet. The holy man laughed softly and prayed aloud, May God cause you to change your life in the way you know you should. The prayer of such a shape is different from other prayers. He has so completely dissolved his ego, nothing himself, that what he says is like God talking to God. How could such a prayer not be granted? The means were found to change NASA. While he was pouring water into a basin for a naked woman, she felt and discovered that a pearl was missing from her earring. Quickly, they locked the doors. They searched the cushions, the towels, the rugs, and the discarded clothes. Nothing. Now they search ears and mouths and every cleft and orifice. Everyone is made to strip, and the Queen's Lady Chamberlain. Z62. Probes one by one the naked women. NASA, meanwhile, has gone to his private closet, trembling. I didn't steal the pearl, but if they undress and search me, they'll see how excited I get with these new ladies. God, please, help me. I have been cold and lecherous, but cover my sin this time, please. Let me not be exposed for how I've been. I'll repent. He weeps and moans and weeps, for the moment is upon him. NASA, we have searched everyone but you. Come out. At that moment his spirit grows wings, and lifts. His ego falls like a battered wall. He unites with God, alive, but emptied of NASA. His ship sinks and in its place move the ocean waves. His body's disgrace, like a falcon's loose and binding, slips from the falcon's foot. His stones drink in water. His field shines like satin with gold threads in it. Someone dead a hundred years steps out well and strong and handsome. A broken stick breaks into bud. This all happens inside NASA, after the call that gave him such fear. A long pause. A long, waiting silence. Then a shout from one of the women, here it is. The bathhouse fills with clapping. NASA sees his new light sparkling out before him. The women come to apologize, we're so sorry we didn't trust you. We just knew that you'd taken that pearl. They kept talking about how they suspected him. And begging his forgiveness. Finally he replies. I am much more guilty than anyone has thought or said. I am the worst person in the world. What you have said is only a hundredth of what I've actually done. Don't ask my pardon. You don't know me. No one knows me. God has hidden my sneakiness. Satan taught me tricks, but after a time, 
those became easy, and I taught Satan some new variations. God saw what I did, but chose not to publicly reveal my sin. And now, I am sown back into wholeness. Whatever I've done, now is not done. Whatever obedience I didn't do, now I did. Pure, noble, free, like a cypress. Like a lily, is how I suddenly am. I said, help me. Oh no. And that oh no, became a rope let down in my well. I climbed out to stand here in the sun. One moment I was at the bottom of a dang, fearful narrowness, and the next. I am not contained by this universe. If every tip of every hair on me could speak, I still couldn't say my gratitude. I-64 In the middle of these streets and gardens, I stand and say and say again, and it's all I say. I wish everyone could know what I know. Moses and the Shepherd Moses heard a shepherd on the road praying. God, where are you? I want to help you, to fix your shoes and comb your hair. I want to wash your clothes and kick the lice off. I want to bring you milk to kiss your little hands and feet when it's time for you to go to bed. I want to sweep your room and keep it neat. God, my sheep and goats are yours. All I can say, remembering you, is a and ah. Moses could stand it no longer. Who are you talking to? The one who made us. And made the earth and made the sky. Don't talk about shoes and socks with God. And what's this with your little hands and feet? Such blasphemous familiarity sounds like you're chatting with your uncles. Only something that grows needs milk. Only someone with feet needs shoes. Not God, even if you meant God's human representatives. As when God said, I was sick, and you did not visit me, even then this tone would be foolish and irreverent. Use appropriate terms. Fatima is a fine name for a woman, but if you call a man Fatima, it's an insult. Body and birth language are right for us on this side of the river, but not for addressing the origin, not for Allah. Is 5. The shepherd repented and tore his clothes and sighed and wandered out into the desert. A sudden revelation came then to Moses. God's voice. You have separated me from one of my own. Did you come as a prophet to unite, or to sever? I have given each being a separate and unique way of seeing and knowing and saying that knowledge. What seems wrong to you is right for him. What is poison to one is honey to someone else. Purity and impurity, sloth and diligence in worship, these mean nothing to me. I am apart from all that. Ways of worshipping are not to be ranked as better or worse than one another. Hindus do Hindu things. The Dravidian Muslims in India do what they do. It's all praise, and it's all right. It's not me that's glorified in acts of worship. It's the worshippers. I don't hear the words they say. I look inside at the humility. That broken open lowliness is the reality, not the language. Forget phraseology. I want burning, burning. Be friends with your burning. Burn up your thinking and your forms of expression. Moses, those who pay attention to ways of behaving and speaking are one sort. Lovers who burn are another. Don't impose a property tax on a burned out village. Don't scold a lover. Good, wrong, the way he talks is better than a hundred. Z66. Right, ways of others. 
Inside the Kaaba it doesn't matter which direction you point your prayer rug. The ocean diver doesn't need snowshoes. The love religion has no code or doctrine. Only God. So the ruby has nothing engraved on it. It doesn't need markings. God began speaking deeper mysteries to Moses. Vision and words, which cannot be recorded here, poured into and through him. He left himself and came back. He went to eternity and came back here. Many times this happened. It's foolish of me to try and say this. If I did say it, it would uproot our human intelligences. It would shatter all writing pens. Moses ran after the shepherd. He followed the bewildered footprints, in one place moving straight like a castle across a chessboard. In another, sideways, like a bishop. Now surging like a wave cresting, now sliding down like a fish, with always his feet making geomancy symbols in the sand, recording his wandering state with him. Moses finally caught up. I was wrong. God has revealed to me that there are no rules for worship. Say whatever and however your loving tells you to. Your sweet blasphemy is the truest devotion. Through you a whole world is free. Z67. Loosen your tongue and don't worry what comes out. It's all the light of the Spirit. The shepherd replied, Moses, Moses, I've gone beyond even that. You applied the whip and my horse shied and jumped out of itself. The divine nature and my human nature came together. Bless your scolding hand and your arm. I can't say what has happened. What I'm saying now is not my real condition. It can't be said. The shepherd grew quiet. When you look in a mirror, you see yourself, not the state of the mirror. The flute player puts breath into a flute, and he makes the music. Not the flute, the flute player. Whenever you speak praise or thanksgiving to God, it's always like this dear shepherd's simplicity. When you eventually see through the veils to how things really are, you will keep saying again and again, this is certainly riot like we thought it was. Joy is sudden disappointment. Whatever comes, comes from a need, a sore distress, a hurting want. Mary's pain made the baby Jesus. Her womb opened its lips and spoke the word. I-68. Every part of you has a secret language. Your hands and your feet say what you've done. And every need brings in what's needed. Pain bears its care like a child. Having nothing produces provisions. Ask a difficult question, and the marvelous answer appears. Build a ship, and there'll be water to float it. The tender-throated infant cries and milk drips from the mother's breast. Be thirsty for the ultimate water, and then be ready for what will come pouring from the spring. A village woman once was walking by Muhammad. She thought he was just an ordinary illiterate. She didn't believe that he was a prophet. She was carrying a two-month-old baby. As she came near Muhammad, the baby turned and said, Peace be with you, messenger of God. The mother cried out, surprised and angry, What are you saying, and how can you suddenly talk? The child replied, God taught me first, and then Gabriel. Who is this Gabriel? I don't see anyone. He is above your head, mother. Turn around. He has been telling me many things. Do you really see him? Yes. He is continually delivering me from this degraded state into sublimity. 69. Muhammad then asked the child, What is your name? 
Abdul Aziz, the servant of God, but this family thinks I am concerned with world energies. I am as free of that as the truth of your prophecy is. So the little one spoke, and the mother took in a fragrance that let her surrender to that state. When God gives this knowing, inanimate stones, plants, animals, everything, fills with unfolding significance. The fish and the birds become protectors. Remember the incident of Muhammad and the eagle. It happened that as he was listening to this inspired baby, he heard a voice calling him to prayer. He asked for Waddle to perform ablutions. He washed his hands and feet, and just as he reached for his boot, an eagle snatched it away. The boot turned upside down as it lifted, and a poisonous snake dropped out. The eagle circled and brought the boot back, saying, My helpless reverence for you made this necessary. Anyone who acts this presumptuously for a legalistic reason should be punished. Muhammad thanked the eagle, and said, What I thought was rudeness was really love. You took away my grief, and I was grieved. God has shown me everything, but at that moment I was preoccupied within myself. The eagle, with chosen one, any clarity I have, comes from you. This spreading radiance of a true human being has great importance. Look carefully around you and recognize the luminosity of souls. Sit beside those who draw you to that. Learn from this evil story that when misfortune comes, you must quickly praise. Others may be saying, oh no, but you will be opening out like a rose losing itself petal by petal. Someone once asked a great sheikh what Sufism was. The feeling of joy when sudden disappointment comes. The eagle carries off Muhammad's food and saves him from snakebite. Don't grieve for what doesn't come. Some things that don't happen keep disasters from happening. If the beloved is everywhere, the lover is a veil, but when living itself becomes a friend, lovers disappear. Story Water A story is like water that you heat for your bath. It takes messages between the fire and your skin. It lets them meet, and it cleans you. 1. 71 very few can sit down in the middle of the fire itself like a salamander or Abraham. We need intermediaries. A feeling of fullness comes, but usually it takes some bread to bring in. Beauty surrounds us, but usually we need to be walking in a garden to know it. The body itself is a screen to shield and partially reveal the light that's blazing inside your presence. Water, stories, the body, all the things we do, are mediums that hide and show what's hidden. Study them, and enjoy this being washed with a secret we sometimes know, and then not. 172 Z6 feet 4 rough metaphors, more teaching stories, on roughness. Some of Rumi's metaphors are rough, raw, and unacceptable to refined tastes. When Reynold Nicholson translated the Mathnui into English in the 192 OS, he chose to render some passages into Latin, supposing that anyone who knew enough Latin to read them would be properly shielded from pain. Rumi uses anything human beings do, no matter how scandalous or cruel or silly, as a lens to examine soul growth. 
A gourd crafted to serve as a flange, allowing a donkey penis to enter a woman's vagina just to the point of her pleasure but not far enough to harm her, becomes a metaphor for a device a sheikh might use to put limits on a disciple. After another graphic, Outra. Geously elaborated comparison of bread making with love making, he concludes, remember. The way you make love is the way God will be with you. For Rumi, the bread of every experience offers nourishment. Rough metaphors. Someone said, there is no dervish, or if there is a dervish, that dervish is not there. Look at a candle flame in bright noon sunlight. If you put cotton next to it, the cotton will burn, but its light has become completely mixed with the sun. That candle light you can't find, is what's left of a dervish. 17 grams 3. If you sprinkle one ounce of vinegar over 200 tons of sugar, no one will ever taste the vinegar. A deer faints in the paws of a lion. The deer becomes another glazed expression on the face of the lion. These are rough metaphors for what happens to the lover. There's no one more openly irreverent than a lover. He, or she, jumps up on the scale opposite eternity and claims to balance it. And no one more secretly reverent. A grammar lesson. The lover died. Lover, is subject and agent, but that can't be. The, lover, is defunct. Only grammatically is the dervish lover a doer. In reality, with he or she so overcome, so dissolved into love, all qualities of doingness disappear. Birdwings. Your grief for what you've lost lifts a mirror up to where you're bravely working. Expecting the worst, you look, and instead, here's the joyful face you've been wanting to see. Your hand opens and closes and opens and closes. If it were always a fist or always stretched open, you would be paralyzed. Your deepest presence is in every small contracting and expanding, the two is beautifully balanced and coordinated as birdwings. Minus 74. I. Come before dawn. Muhammad says. I come before dawn to chain you and drag you off. It's amazing, and funny, that you have to be pulled away from being tortured, pulled out into this spring garden, but that's the way it is. Almost everyone must be bound and dragged here. Only a few come on their own. Children have to be made to go to school at first. Then some of them begin to like it. They run to school. They expand with the learning. Later, they receive money because of something they've learned at school, and they get really excited. They stay up all night, as watchful and alive as thieves. Remember the rewards you get for being obedient. There are two types on the path. Those who come against their will, the blindly religious people, and those who obey out of love. The former have ulterior motives. They want the midwife near, because she gives them milk. The others love the beauty of the nurse. The former memorize the proof texts of conformity, and repeat them. The latter disappear into whatever draws them to God. Both are drawn from the source. Any moving from the mover. Any love from the beloved. Checkmate. Borrow the beloved's eyes. Look through them and you'll see the beloved's face. 1.75. Everywhere. No tiredness. No jaded boredom. I shall be your eye and your hand and your loving. Let that happen, and things you have hated will become helpers.
A certain preacher always prays long and with enthusiasm for thieves and mothers that attack people on the street. Let your mercy, zero Lord, cover their insolence. He doesn't pray for the good, but only for the blatantly cruel. Why is this? His congregation asks. Because they have done me such generous favors. Every time I turn back toward the things they want, I run into them, they beat me, and leave me nearly dead in the road, and I understand, again, that what they want is not what I want. They keep me on the spiritual path. That's why I honor them and pray for them. Those that make you return, for whatever reason, to God's solitude, be grateful to them. Worry about the others, who give you delicious comforts that keep you from prayer. Friends are enemies sometimes, and enemies friends. There is an animal called an usher, a porcupine. If you hit it with a stick, it eats its quills and gets bigger. The soul is a porcupine, made strong by stick eating. So a prophet's soul is especially afflicted, because it has to become so powerful. A hide is soaked in tanning liquor and becomes leather. If the tanner did not rub in the acid, the hide would get foul smelling and rotten. The soul is a newly skinned hide, bloody and gross. Work on it with manual discipline, and the bitter tanning acid of grief, and you'll become lovely, and very strong. 76. If you can't do this work yourself, don't worry. You don't even have to make a decision, one way or another. The friend, who knows a lot more than you do, will bring difficulties, and grief, and sickness, as medicine, as happiness, as the essence of the moment when you're beaten, when you hear checkmate, and can finally say, with Halliday's voice, I trust you to kill me. A an awkward comparison. This physical world has no two things alike. Every comparison is awkwardly rough. You can put a lion next to a man, but the placing is hazardous to both. Say the body is like this lamp. It has to have a wick and oil, sleep and food. If it doesn't get those, it will die, and it's always burning those up, trying to die. But where is the sun in this comparison? It rises, and the lamp's light mixes with the day. Oneness, which is the reality, cannot be understood with lamp and sun images. The blurring of a plural into a unity is wrong. No image can describe what of our fathers and mothers, our grandfathers and grandmothers, remains. Language does not touch the one who lives in each of us. 77. Two Kinds of Intelligence There are two kinds of intelligence. One acquired, as a child in school memorizes facts and concepts from books and from what TNE teacher says, collecting information from the traditional sciences as well as from the new sciences. With such intelligence you rise in the world. You get ranked ahead or behind others in regard to your competence in retaining information. You stroll with this intelligence in and out of fields of knowledge, getting always more marks on your preserving tablets. There is another kind of tablet, one already completed and preserved inside you. A spring overflowing its spring box. A freshness in the center of the chest. This other intelligence does not turn yellow or stagnate. It's fluid, and it doesn't move from outside to inside through the conduits of plumbing learning. This second knowing is a fountainhead from within you, moving out. Two ways of running. 
A certain man had a jealous wife and a very, very appealing maidservant. The wife was careful not to leave them alone, ever. For six years they were never left in a room together. But then one day at the public bath the wife suddenly remembered that she'd left her silver wash basin at home. Please, go get the basin, she told her maid. The girl jumped to the task, because she knew that she would finally get to be alone with the master. She ran joyfully. She flew. And desire took them both so quickly that they didn't even latch the door. With great speed they joined each other. When bodies blend in population, spirits also merge. Meanwhile, the wife back at the bathhouse, washing her hair, what have I done? I've set the cotton wool on fire. I've put the ram in with the you. She washed the clay soap off her hair and ran, fixing her chador about her as she went. The maid ran for love. The wife ran out of fear and jealousy. There is a great difference. The mystic flies moment to moment. The fearful ascetic drags along month to month. But also the length of a day to a lover may be 50,000 years. You can't understand this with your mind. You must burst open. Fear is nothing to a lover, a tiny piece of bread. Love is a quality of God. Fear is an attribute of those who think they serve God, but who are actually preoccupied with penis and vagina. You have read in the text where they love him blends what he loves them. Those joining loves are both qualities of God. Fear is not. What characteristics do God and human beings have in common? What is the connection between what lives in time and what lives in eternity? If I kept talking about love, a hundred new combinings would happen, and still I would not say the mystery. The fearful aesthetic runs on foot, along the surface. Lovers move like lightning and wind. No contest. Theologians mumble, rumble dumble, necessity and free will, while lover and beloved pull themselves into each other. The worried wife reaches the door and opens it. The maid, disheveled, confused, flushed, unable to speak. The husband begins his five times prayer. The wife enters this agitated scene. As though experimenting with clothes, the husband holds up some flaps and edges. She sees his testicles and penis so wet, semen still dribbling out, spurts of jism and vaginal juices drenching the thighs of the maid. The wife slaps him on the side of the head, is this the way a man prays, with his balls? Is your penis long for union like this? Is that why her legs are so covered with this stuff? These are good questions she's asking her. Ascetic, husband. People who renounce desires often turn, suddenly, into hypocrites. Z-A-D-O The importance of G-O-U-R-D-C-R-A-F-T-I-N-G there was a maidservant who had cleverly trained a donkey to perform the services of a man. From a board, she had carved a planned device to fit on the donkey penis, to keep him from going too far into her. She had fashioned it just to the point of her pleasure, and she greatly enjoyed the arrangement, as often as she could. She cried, but the donkey was getting a little thin and tired looking. The mistress began to investigate. One day she peeped through a crack in the door and saw the animal's marvelous member and the delight of the girl stretched under the donkey. She said nothing. Later, 
she knocked on the door and called the maid out on an errand, a long and complicated errand. I won't go into details. The servant knew what was happening, though. Ah, my mistress, she thought to herself, you should not send away the expert. When you begin to work without full knowledge, you risk your life. Your shame keeps you from asking me about the gourd, but you must have that to join with this donkey. There's a trick you don't know. But the woman was too fascinated with her idea to consider any danger. She led the donkey in. I ate. And closed the door, thinking, with no one around I can shout in my pleasure. She was busy with anticipation, her vagina glowing and singing like a nightingale. She arranged the chair under the donkey, as she had seen the girl do. She raised her legs and pulled him into her. Her fire kindled more, and the donkey politely pushed as she urged him to, pushed through and into her intestines, and, without a word, she died. The chair fell one way, and she the other. The room was smeared with blood. Reader. Have you ever seen anyone martyred for a donkey? Remember what the Quran says about the torment of disgracing yourself. Don't sacrifice your life to your animal soul. If you die of what that leads you to do, you are just like this woman on the floor. She is an image of a moderation. Remember her, and keep your balance. The maidservant returns and says, Yes, you saw my pleasure, but you didn't see the gourd that put a limit on it. You opened your shop before a master taught you the craft. 182. B-R-E-A-D-M-A-K-I-N-G. There was a feast. The king was heartily in his cups. He saw a learned scholar walking by. Bring him in and give him some of this fine wine. Servants rushed out and brought the man to the king's table, but he was not receptive. I had rather drink poison. I have never tasted wine and never will. Take it away from me. He kept on with these loud refusals, disturbing the atmosphere of the feast. This is how it sometimes is at God's table. Someone who has feared about ecstatic love, but never tasted it, disrupts the banquet. If there were a secret passage from his ear to his throat, everything in him would change. Initiation would occur. As it is, he's all fire and no light, all husk and no kernel. The king gave orders. Cupbearer, do what you must. This is how your invisible guide acts, the chess champion across from you that always wins. He cut the scholar's head and said, Taste. Z83. And, again, the cup was drained and the intellectual started singing and telling ridiculous jokes. He joined the garden, snapping his fingers and swaying. Soon, of course, he had to pee. He went out, and there, near the latrine, was a beautiful woman, one of the king's harem. His mouth hung open. He wanted her. Right then, he wanted her. And she was not unwilling. They fell to, on the ground. You've seen a baker rolling dough. He kneads it gently at first, then more roughly. He pounds it on the board. It softly groans under his palms. Now he spreads it out and rolls it flat. Then he bunches it, and rolls it all the way out again, thin. Now he adds water, and mixes it well. Now salt, and a little more salt. Now he shapes it delicately to its final shape and slides it into the oven, which is already hot. You remember bread making. This is how your desire tangles with a desired one.
184. And it's not just a metaphor for a man and a woman making love. Warriors in battle do this too. A great mutual embrace is always happening between the eternal and what dies, between essence and accident. The sport has different rules in every case, but it's basically the same, and remember, the way you make love is the way God will be with you. So these two were lost in their sexual trance. They did not care anymore about feasting or wine. Their eyes were closed like perfectly matching calligraphy lines. The king went looking for the scholar, and when he saw them their couple, commented, Well, as it is said, a good king must serve his subjects from his own table. There is joy, a wine-like freedom that dissolves the mind and restores the spirit, and there is manly fortitude like the king's, a reasonableness that accepts the bewildered lostness. But meditate now on steadfastness and clarity, and let those be the wings that lift and soar through the celestial spheres. Z85 Z7 I Solomon Poems, The Far Moss, On Solomon, Solomon and Sheba are types for the courtship story going on in all of Rumi's poetry. King Solomon Luminous Divine Wisdom sends messengers to coax the Queen of Sheba, the bodily soul, to leave her kingdom and come live with him. She coyly sends envoys back with foolishly inappropriate gifts, and when she herself finally arrives, she does so with the one thing she cannot bear to leave, her filigree. Throne the body. The marriage of spiritual vision with the body finds many metaphors throughout Rumi's art. Jesus riding the lean donkey, the way a river dissolves into the ocean, dawn sunlight filling a ruby, the nights he contained in a person's eyes. The ecstatic astonishment within Rumi's poetry comes from his first-hand wonder at how the ocean comes to court the drop. I once had a dream where I was supposed to give a lecture on Rumi and D. H. Lawrence, but I couldn't find the lecture hall. The challenge was to connect Lawrence's dark body knowledge with Rumi's spiritual enlightenment. I ended up in some anteroom meeting hors d'oeuvres. The mind knows when it's been assigned work outside its purview. Rumi's poetry nourishes the part of us that wants a continually unfolding truth, not some confined conclusion. The relationship of soul wisdom and the body, Solomon and Sheba, is a dynamic dance that keeps generating stories. Sheba's gifts to Solomon. Queen Sheba loads 40 mules with gold bricks as gifts for Solomon. When her envoy and his party reach the wide plain leading to Solomon's palace. Z86. They see that the top layer of the entire plain is pure gold. They travel on gold for 40 days. What foolishness to take gold to Solomon, when the dirt of his land is gold. You who think to offer. Your intelligence, reconsider. The mind is less than road dust. The embarrassing commonness they bring only slows them down. They argue. They discuss turning back, but they continue, carrying out the orders of their queen. Solomon laughs when he sees them unloading gold bars. When have I asked you for a sock for my suit? I don't want gifts from you. I want you to be ready for the gifts I give. You worship a planet that creates gold. Worship instead the one who creates the universe. You worship the sun. The sun is only a cook. Think of a solar eclipse. What if you get attacked at midnight? Who will help you then? These astronomical matters fade. Another intimacy happens. 
A sun at midnight, with no east, no night or day. The clearest intelligence is faint, seeing the solar system flickering, so tiny in that immense lightness. Drops fall into a vapor, and the vapor explodes into a galaxy. Half a ray strikes a patch of darkness. A new sun appears. One slight, alchemical gesture, and Saturnine qualities form inside the planet Saturn. Z87. The sensuous eye needs sunlight to see. Moves another eye. Vision is luminous. Sight is igneous, and sun fire light very dark. Solomon to Shiva. Solomon says to the messengers from Shiva, I send you back as messengers to her. Tell her this refusal of her gift of gold is better than acceptance. Because with it she can learn what we value. She loves her throne, but actually it keeps her from passing through the doorway that leads to a true majesty. Tell her, one surrendering bow is sweeter than a hundred empires, is itself a kingdom. Be dizzy and wandering like Ibrahim, who suddenly left everything. In a narrow well things look backward from how they are. Stones and metal objects seem treasure, as broken pottery does to children pretending to be you lie and sell. Tell her, Joseph sat in such a well, then reached to take the rope that rose to a new understanding. The alchemy of a changing life is the only truth. Shiva's hesitation. Lovers of God, sometimes a door opens, and a human being becomes a way for grace to come through. Z88 I see various herbs in the kitchen garden, each with its own bed, garlic, capers, saffron, and basil, each watered differently to help it mature. We keep the delicate ones separate from the turnips, but there's room for all in this unseen world, so vast that the Arabian desert gets lost in it like a single hair. In the ocean, imagine that you or Shiva trying to decide whether to go to Solomon. You're haggling about how much to pay. For shooing a donkey, when you could be seated with one who is always in union with God, who carries a beautiful garden inside himself. You could be moving in a circuit without wings, nourished without eating, sovereign without a throne. No longer subject to fortune, you could be luck itself. If you would rise from sleep, leave the market arguing, and learn that your own essence is your wealth. Sheba's Throne When the Queen of Sheba came to Solomon, she left behind her kingdom and her wealth the same way lovers leave their reputations. Her servants meant nothing to her, less than a rotten onion. Her palaces and orchards, so many piles of dawn. She heard the inner meaning of L.A. No, she came to Solomon with nothing, except her throne. As the writer's pen becomes a friend, as the tool the workman uses day after day becomes deeply familiar, so her filigree throne was her one attachment. Z89 I would explain more about this phenomenon, but it would take too long. It was a large throne and difficult to transport, because it couldn't be taken apart, being as cunningly put together as the human body. Solomon saw that her heart was open to him and that this throne would soon be repulsive to her. Let her bring it, he said. It will become a lesson to her like the old shoes and jacket or tie is. She can look at that throne and see how far she's come. In the same way, God keeps the process of generation constantly before us.
The smooth skin and the semen and the growing embryo. When you see a pearl on the bottom, you reach through the foam and broken sticks on the surface. When the sun comes up, you forget about locating the constellation of Scorpio. When you see the splendor of union, the attractions of duality seem poignant and lovely, but much less interesting. Solomon's Crooked Crown Solomon was busy judging others, when it was his personal thoughts that were disrupting the community. His crown slid crooked on his head. He put it straight, but the crown went awry again. Eight times this happened. I-90. Finally he began to talk to his headpiece. Why do you keep tilting over my eyes? I have to. When your power loses compassion, I have to show what such a condition looks like. Immediately Solomon recognized the truth. He knelt and asked forgiveness. The crown centered itself on his crown. When something goes wrong, accuse yourself first. Even the wisdom of Plato or Solomon can wobble and go blind. Listen when your crown reminds you of what makes you pull toward others, as you tamper the greedy energy inside. The Far Mosque The place that Solomon made to worship in, called the Far Mosque, is not built of earth and water and stone, but of intention and wisdom and mystical conversation and compassionate action. Every part of it is intelligence and responsive to every other. The carpet bows to the broom. The door knocker and the door swing together like musicians. This heart sanctuary does exist, but it can't be described. Why try? Solomon goes there every morning and gives guidance with words, with musical harmonies, and in actions, which are the deepest teaching. A prince is just a conceit until he does something with generosity. 9. A bird delegation came to Solomon complaining, why is it you never criticize the nightingale? Because my way, the nightingale explained for Solomon, is different. Mid-March to mid-June I sing. The other nine months, while you continue chirping, I'm silent. 192. Z8. For the three fish. Gamble everything for love. On gambling. To a frog that's never left his pond the ocean seems like a gamble. Look what he's giving up. Security, mastery of his world, recognition. The ocean frog just shakes his head. I can't really explain what it's like where I live, but someday I'll take you there. If you want what visible reality can give, you're an employee. If you want the unseen world, you're not living your truth. Both wishes are foolish, but you'll be forgiven for forgetting that what you really want is love's confusing joy. Gamble everything for love, if you're a true human being. If not, leave this gathering. Half-heartedness doesn't reach into majesty. You set out to find God, but then you keep. 193. Stopping for long periods of mean-spirited roadhouses. In a boat down a fast-running creek, it feels like trees on the bank are rushing by. What seems? To be changing around us is rather the speed of our craft leaving this world. The Three Fish This is the story of the lake and the three big fish that were in it. One of them intelligent, another half intelligent, and the third, stupid. Some fishermen came to the edge of the lake with their nets. The three fish saw them. The intelligent fish decided at once to leave, to make the long, difficult trip to the ocean. 
He thought. I won't consult with these two on this. They will only weaken my resolve, because they love this place so. They call it home. Their ignorance will keep them here. When you're traveling, ask a traveler for advice, not someone whose lameness keeps him in one place. Muhammad says, Love of one's country. 194. Is part of the faith. But don't take that literally. Your real country is where you're heading, not where you are. Don't misread the hadith. In the ritual ablutions, according to tradition, there's a separate prayer for each body part. When you snuff water up your nose to cleanse it, beg for the scent of the spirit. The proper prayer is, Lord, wash me. My hand has washed this part of me, but my hand can't wash my spirit. I can wash this skin, but you must wash me. A certain man used to say the wrong prayer for the wrong hole. He'd say the nose prayer when he splashed his behind. Can the odor of heaven come from our rumps? Don't be humble with fools. Don't take pride into the presence of a master. It's right to love your home place, but first ask, where is that, really? The wise fish saw the men in their nets and said, I'm leaving. Ali was told a secret doctrine by Muhammad and told not to tell it, so he whispered it down the mouth of a well. Sometimes there's no one to talk to. You must just set out on your own. So the intelligent fish made its whole length of moving footprint and, like a deer the dog's chase, suffered greatly on its way, but finally made it to the endless safety of the sea. The half-intelligent fish thought, My guide has gone. I ought to have gone with him, but I didn't, and now I've lost my chance to escape. 195. I wish I'd gone with him. Don't regret what's happened. If it's in the past, let it go. Don't even remember it. A certain man caught a bird in a trap. The bird said, Sir, you have eaten many cows and sheep in your life, and you're still hungry. The little bit of meat on my bones won't satisfy you either. If you let me go, I'll give you three pieces of wisdom. One I'll say standing on your hand, one on your roof, and one I'll speak from the limb of that tree. The man was interested. He freed the bird and let it stand on his hand. Number one. Do not believe in absurdity, no matter who says it. The bird flew and lit on the man's roof. Number two. Do not grieve over what is past. It's over. Never regret what has happened. By the way, the bird continued, in my body there's a huge pearl weighing as much as 10 copper coins. It was meant to be the inheritance of you and your children, but now you've lost it. You could have owned the largest pearl in existence, but evidently it was not meant to be. The man started wailing like a woman in childbirth. The bird, didn't I just say, don't grieve for what's in the past. And also, don't believe in absurdity. My entire body doesn't weigh as much as 10 copper coins. How could I have a pearl that heavy inside me? The man came to his senses. All right, tell me number three. Yes. You've made such good use of the first two. 196. Don't give advice to someone who's groggy and falling asleep. Don't throw seeds on the sand. Some torn places cannot be patched. Back to the second fish. 
the half-intelligent one. He mourns the absence of his guide for a while, and then thinks, what can I do to save myself from these men and their nets? Perhaps if I pretend to be already dead, I'll belly up on the surface and float like waves float, just giving myself totally to the water. To die before I die, as Muhammad said to. So he did that. He bobbed up and down, helpless, within arm's reach of the fisherman. Look at this. The best and biggest fish is dead. One of the men lifted him by the tail, spat on him, and threw him up on the ground. He rolled over and over and slid secretly near the water, and then, back in. Meanwhile, the third fish, the dumb one, was agitatedly jumping about, trying to escape with his agility and cleverness. The net, of course, finally closed around him, and as he lay in the terrible frying pan bed, he thought, if I get out of this, I'll never live again in the limits of a lake. Next time, the ocean, I'll make the infinite my home. 9 to 7. Send the chaperones away. Inside me a hundred beings are putting their fingers to their lips and saying, that's enough for now. Shish. Silence is an ocean. Speech is a river. When the ocean is searching for you, don't walk to the language river. Listen to the ocean, and bring your talky business to an end. Traditional words are just babbling in that presence, and babbling is a substitute for sight. When you sit down beside your beloved, send the chaperones away, the old women who brought you together. When you are mature and with your love, the love letters and matchmakers seem irritating. You might read those letters, but only to teach beginners about love. One who sees grows silent. When you're with one of those, be still and quiet, unless he asks you to talk. Then draw the words out as I do this poem with Hassani, the radiance of God. I try to stop talking, but he makes me continue. Usam, if you are in the vision, why do you want me to say words? Maybe it's like the poet Abu Mu'is, who said in Arabic, Pour me some wine, and talk to me about the wine. The cup is at my mouth, but my ear interrupts. I want some. Oh here, what you get is the heat. You turn red with this wine. But the ear says, I want more than that. When I remember your love, I weep, and when I hear people talking of you, something in my chest, where nothing much happens now, moves as in sleep. All our lives we've looked into each other's faces. That was the case today too. How do we keep our love secret? We speak from brow to brow and hear with our eyes. The gift of water. Someone who doesn't know the Tigris River exists brings the Caliph who lives near the river a jar of fresh water. The Caliph accepts, thanks him, and gives in return a jar filled with gold coins. Since this man has come through the desert, he should return by water. Taken out by another door, the man steps into a waiting boat. 99. And sees the wide freshwater of the Tigris. He bows his head, what wonderful kindness that he took my gift. Every object and being in the universe is a jar overfilled with wisdom and beauty, a drop of the tigress that cannot be contained by any skin. Every jarful spills and makes the earth more shining, as though covered in satin. If the man had seen even a tributary of the great river, he wouldn't have brought the innocence of his gift. 
Those that stay and live by the tigers grow so ecstatic that they throw rocks at the jugs, and the jugs become perfect. They shatter, the pieces dance, and water. Can you see? Neither jar, nor water, nor stone, nothing. You knock at the door of reality, shake your thought wings, loosen your shoulders, and open. 200. Z9P. Jesus Poems. The population of the world. On Jesus. There's a strong connection between Jesus and Rumi. I'm told a Christian church in Shiraz, Iran, has a quatrain from Rumi carved in stone over its door. Where Jesus lives, the great hearted gather. We are a door that's never locked. If you are suffering any kind of pain, stay near this door. Open it. A sweet inclusiveness and healing mercy are felt around both. The friendship of Rumi and Shams has no parallel in the great aloneness of Jesus' life, but the relationship with children and with society's outcasts is very similar. Rumi showed deep consideration for the least recognized members of his 13th century Muslim small town.